Well, I'm glad that you made it through the uh, blizzard of the century. And uh, it was beautiful to come and see how the Lord cleaned all the roads off last night with the rain, isn't it? I mean, it was just the sand was left. And I thought that was wonderful. Let's open our Bibles to the second book of the New Testament, the Gospel by Mark. I can't think of anything more thrilling than uh, to be together with you at the beginning of the new year, to be celebrating the new covenant, which is what communion is all about, and to be beginning uh, in this second book of the New Testament, the Gospel by Mark, which is preeminently a gospel about the God of new beginnings. Now look down with me at your Bibles, because in, in my Bible, when I go to the second book of the New Testament, the first word I see is about this, this big. Okay, do you have printing about that big right at the top of that book? What, what does it say? Mark, right? Uh, someone said Schofield. No. No. Uh, Mark, you know, when you go to the second book... It's the gospel by, and then they have gigantic print in my Bible, which is, I don't know what, a Holman. But it just says Mark. You know, the, when I come to this book, the first word of this book is what we call it all the time. The gospel by Mark. And this morning as we go back and begin again looking at this book, we're going to fast forward in the weeks ahead to the fifth chapter. But this is actually, for those of you that have been here a long time, this is the 72nd message in the book of Mark that I've preached. Now, some of you say, wow, and you're only in the first word. No, we got all the way to the fifth chapter, but for some of you, you've joined us since then. And I want to get you caught up. And I want to reintroduce to you this morning this book. Because you and I have the privilege of a new beginning. I don't know what your 2006 was like. You might have had a wonderful year. Or you might have had a horrible year. But whichever type of 2006 you had, God, the God of the new covenant, the God who promises us a new heart and a new spirit, and the God who says that anyone who is in Jesus Christ is a new creation, and the God who says that I offer to you newness every morning, great is my faithfulness, as he said in Lamentations 3, is the God who through the work of Jesus Christ Let's each of us begin anew and afresh in Him. And that's most clearly seen as we look at this Gospel, just in the very name of the Gospel by Mark. We're returning to our study of God's Word in the second book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark. But before us, as we go there, lay four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there's one theme that all four of them have. And before we even jump into Mark, I want you to remember that the Gospels are preeminently about Jesus Christ. Each of them has a different angle, a different vantage point, a different purpose, a different theme. But all of them have the, the central purpose to be to introduce Jesus Christ. Matthew captures him as a perfect king. Everything is structured around that. His ancestry is given. His birth is described, complete with a royal retinue. His life is lived, absolutely marvelously reflecting him as the king of Israel. And Jesus, even in his death, is shown to be the one who wants to be our king. In fact, the New Testament picks up that the early church caught that because when they were being persecuted... Early on in the, the city of Thessalonica, the accusation was that they have a different king, one Jesus. And so as Matthew presented him, so he was seen as king. Luke captures him as the perfect man. In fact, the only perfect man that ever lived. We live in a world of imperfection and falseness and death and disease and disaster and everything else. But Jesus came to seek and to save all the imperfect ones. And as Phil said in his testimony... That's the first step of salvation. Realize that we are lost, that we are fallen, that we are sinful, that we are helpless. That we are facing disaster and ruin. That we are sinners. So Jesus came as the seeker and saver of sinners. He was the perfect man. John presents him and captures him as the perfect deity. Jesus came into a world of false gods and fallen gods and feeble gods. That's what the first century was like. The the vicissitudes of the Roman pantheon and all the uh, 
uh, cavorting around that Zeus did and everything else. It was all common to them. So they had very imperfect kind of uh, capricious gods. And there enters the real God of creation. That's what John's all about. The real God, the true God, the creator God. And he comes to give us abundant life. So each of the Gospels is focused around something different, but the same central object is Jesus Christ. But in Mark, Mark captures Jesus as the perfect servant. And what I like about this is, Mark shows us that all of us who are imperfect servants, who don't perfectly love the Lord, don't perfectly serve the Lord, don't perfectly obey the Lord, that there's a place for us. Because that takes us to the very name, the Gospel by Mark. Jesus is the perfect servant, but He's the only perfect servant God has ever had. The only perfect servant was His Son, Jesus Christ. All the rest of the countless men and women and boys and girls that God has used have been imperfect. And the reason I stress that is, is when I open this book, Humanly, I know that the inspired words are the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where the Bible begins. But my eyes can't resist looking up above that to that title. And when I see that big title and what I call this book all the time, it takes me back to the person that God used as the human writer of this book. And that's what I want to focus with you on this morning briefly. And before we go to the New Covenant celebration of communion, I want you to think about Mark and how his very life reminds us of the gospel of new beginnings. Because every time you open your Bible and find a book named Mark, you're looking at a testimony of the God of heaven who has mercy on all of us who fall, who fail, and who flee to him. And he gives us a new beginning. I think often of a little question that all of us who are having the privilege of vocational Christian ministry who are called and spend our lives ministering the word and ministering to people a common question people have is after a great disaster in their life and they come back to the Lord they say can God use like me who has failed and my habit has been for a long time to take them and show them what I want to show you in fact this morning if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 12 I want to introduce the author of this book from the Bible so the way to understand the book of Mark is to go to Acts chapter 12 and find out about who it is God happened to use to write this. Because if you've ever failed or quit or walked away from an assignment from God, we have to remember that we serve the God of the second chance. The God whose strength is made perfect in our what? Weakness. Mark was a very weak person, we're going to find as we track through. God is the God of new beginnings, as I said to you from Lamentation. He, he in Lamentations 3.23, uh, His mercies are new every morning. Uh, when we wake up, he's just, he's just offering up a freshly uh, new batch of mercy for us for that day. It's new every morning. It's fresh. It's ours. He is the God who is the God of new beginnings. And He wants us to be a new creation. And so, Mark... Is a demonstration of that. Now, before I go too far, there are two lives inseparably bound to this book. Uh, Mark is a human writer, but the eyes that saw the events and the voice of who is describing Jesus Christ is not Mark. History tells us that it's Mark writing down the recollections and the, the feelings and the, the actual events that were experienced through Peter. So next time when we get together, if there are no ice storms or typhoons or earthquakes or anything, Lord willing, we're going to look at the other half of the equation. Because this is the gospel by Mark, but it's through the eyes of Peter. So there are two lives that are inseparably bound in this, this beautiful portrait of Jesus Christ, Mark and Peter. And, and what's so amazing is how, how the Lord even links lives, and we'll see that when we get into the book of Acts. But one of the greatest honors imaginable is getting to be a part of God's book of books. You know, God wrote a book, you're holding it, the Bible, and He says this book that you're holding and I have is forever settled in heaven. It's going to be around forever. These words, these events, what God captured, what God inspired through His Holy Spirit, through the 40 plus different authors over 1600 years that wrote these these words down for him, it's forever settled in heaven. 
So the special servants that God chose to communicate that book are quite a select and special group. In fact, part of the joy of heaven is going to be meeting some of these obscure people. I remember at Dallas Seminary, Howie Hendricks used to always say that uh, he would ask the incoming students, he'd say, uh, um, you ever read Habakkuk? And a lot of them, you know, believe it or not, hadn't. And he says, do you know what embarrassment is going to be in heaven to walk up to a guy and say, hi, I'm so for you. And he'd say, Habakkuk. And they'd go, and who are you? And he'd say, I wrote a book in the Bible. And you'd go, oh. You know, can you imagine getting to heaven and never reading Habakkuk? And I hope that doesn't happen, but it's a select group. And God has several groups he highlights in his revelation to us. Those are, the, of course, the patriarchs and, and those that were before the flood and after the flood. And then those, those kings and prophets and the twelve apostles. But the ones that, that stand out most to us are those that wrote these accounts, the 40-plus authors. They're a very select group. And this morning... We've opened our Bibles to the name linked to the book we're going to study that wrote the gospel, and it's called the Gospel by Mark. For as long as believers live on earth, that's what we will call these 16 chapters. And whenever we read the account that captures Christ through the eyes of Peter under the flawless breath of God's Spirit, we'll always remember it's from the hand and from the pen and through the personal labor of Mark. And I'm... I'm emphasizing that because I want you to realize who Mark was, his pedigree. Let's look at Mark's bio. Let's look at who God used, starting in Acts chapter 12 and verse 24. Because to understand the man God used to write down the second gospel, we need to see what the, the Spirit-inspired biography in Acts chapter 12 and verse 24 of this man contains. In Acts, the message we get is that Mark was politely speaking, a dropout. He was a quitter. He was a failure. And it wouldn't be nice to say such things if the Bible didn't record it that way. So I'd like you to see what God says about this man as we read together Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 24, and we'll go all the way to chapter 13 and verse 5. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. And you follow along, and I'll read. Acts 12, 24, the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So there's our first time introduction to this fellow that writes the gospel. Chapter 13, verse 1, now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Verse 3, Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And verse 5, And when they had arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now look at the end of verse 5. They also had John, the same John that's in the last... 12, the same John Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark, they had John as their assistant. There he is. Let's learn about him. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you would, in a special way, take this, this historic note and the ones that follow and teach us deep truth that we can, can, by your Spirit, convert into action in our lives and choices we make. That we will live and believe and walk with you who are the God of new beginnings. And we would never look at the gospel by Mark in the same way again. And when we struggle and when we slide and fail and fall and think that, that we've done it once too much, that we would be reminded that you're the God of new beginnings, just like with Mark. Celebrate this communion. May it be the new covenant, the new testament, the new beginning that we have in you, O Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you are right there in chapter 12 and 13, just think of the historic moments. I just want to explain to you, we've jumped into the book of Acts in the middle of it, and these are historic moments. What we're on is, uh, we're on the first missionary journey. 
I mean, we have people that, that love missions. We have missionaries even here this morning. We have people that have devoted their lives to missions. Can you imagine the glow in Mark's eyes? He was going on the first missionary journey. This was the first, I mean, every Sunday school child, when they go through Sunday school, they have those charts on the wall, and in the backs of Bibles are the first missionary journey of Paul. Mark was on the first missionary journey. Can you imagine what it was like? Here Mark was living in the very epicenter of the mighty work of God as it radiated from Jerusalem through his apostles and prophets. I mean, he was living in the, the beginning of what God was doing, unleashing the gospel across the Roman world. Antioch, that huge Roman city, had become the thriving new center of Christianity. God had raised up evangelists and prophets and now missionaries. You remember that Antioch was the third city of the empire, and the church had gone out through the persecutions of Saul and had sent out uh, believers, and they had gotten as far as Antioch, and a marvelous working of the Spirit of God had gone on. In fact, Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. So that's kind of our spiritual home. If you call yourself a Christian, if you are a Christian this morning, you go back because believers, followers of the way, were first called Christians in Antioch. And so it was just thriving. And now the church was recognizing the chief nurturing discipler, the man that, that, that discipled, kind of the original Dawson Trotman, you know, the, if you know the Navigator founder, or the uh, discipler of all was Barnabas. So the chief discipling man of the first century and his greatest disciple. You know who Barnabas discipled? Paul. He's the one that took him under his wing and, and, and the Lord used to nurture him. Those two men were being sent out to expand the gospel beyond Jerusalem and Antioch to the furthest ends of the world. That's what was going on. And they were going to be sent out to obey the great commission of Christ. And that was the new wave of the future. Missionaries sent out from a mother church to far off places, supported by the body of Christ back home. And John Mark, the last verse of chapter 12, was personally recruited to go on that team. Wow. This was only another in a great string of great honors for him. And if you are a note taker, and if you can find some corner of your bulletin to write notes on, or if you want to write in your Bible, it, I would encourage you to who Mark was. Because when I tell you about his quitting, I want you to remember how far down he had fallen. Number one, Mark was personally led to faith. He was led to the Lord by none other than Peter himself. I mean, you talk about a big deal. The, the greatest, the leader of the apostles, Peter himself, it says in 1 Peter 5.13, led Mark to faith. So Mark was saved through the personal evangelism of the apostle Peter. And that, that, talk about something on your resume, in the early church, that was a big deal. I mean, Peter, who was the foremost and the, the, the most outspoken of all the apostles, the most well-known, people trembled before him, and everything going on, Peter led Mark to the Lord. But that isn't at all. Colossians 4.10 tells us Mark was discipled by the greatest disciple of the early church, who actually discipled Paul. He was discipled by Barnabas, who just happened to be his uncle. So he was related to a luminary. He was led to Christ by Peter, discipled by Barnabas. But then, you're, you're in Acts. Look back at verse 12 of chapter 12, okay? Because we're close to this one. I want you to see it. Thirdly, Mark not only was saved through the personal evangelism of Peter, discipled through the personal uh, discipleship skills of Barnabas, but Mark was nurtured at the feet of the giants of the faith. And what I mean by that is it says in Acts 12, 12, uh, when the whole... Uh, capturing of the apostles and Peter was in jail and they were praying that he wouldn't be killed and all that. Do you remember the prayer meeting and Rhoda and all that? Look what it says in 12. So when he considered this, he came, Peter, when he was released by the angel from prison, came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, which could be a little confusing. We might wonder which John it is until the next line comes along in verse 12, whose surname was Mark. Now, if you put all that together, all of a sudden you realize that Mark's mother was the wealthy woman that had the big home that the early church used to meet in. And it was kind of like the focal point of the church in Jerusalem. And so John Mark grew up in the home where the greatest events of the early church went on. When the church decided they were going to gather to pray for Peter, they went to their gathering place, which was John Mark's mother's house. 
When Peter got released by the angel from prison, where did he first go? He knew where the early church would gather. He went to this place where he had led the son of this gracious woman who allowed the church to meet in her home, her little boy, or young man, John Mark, to faith. And so can you imagine what it was like for John Mark, who was living in the home where the greatest of all the early saints frequented? What a, an amazing place to go to church with, with the apostles themselves. And, and then with, with those that the Lord raised up, like Barnabas, and then Paul, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they had Peter coming through and leading the prayer meetings. I mean, this fella was nurtured at the feet of the giants. But now... Look at chapter 13 of Acts and verse 6. Mark was doing his ministry residency with the greatest of the great in century one. I mean, he'd been saved by, by being led to the Lord by Peter. He'd been nurtured by Barnabas. He'd been brought up at the epicenter of the church. And now his residency, to use medical terms, you know how doctors do residency to really learn how to do it right. And they kind of eat and sleep at the hospital and doing their rounds. Well, look what he gets to do. Just like the doctors who had to eat and sleep and live in the hospital to earn their right to practice medicine, Mark was given the awesome privilege of a ministry residence with Paul the Apostle. Now that would be neat. I mean, I got to do my residency at Grace Church, and I thought it was unbelievable with, with MacArthur, but can you imagine having Paul? Paul, the founder of what we know as the New Testament Church, Paul? Who, who wrote the epistles and explains to us the doctrine, who, who connects together the old and the new. Wow. Residency with Paul. Mark must have felt his ministry career mushroomed as he departed on this historic first missionary journey with Paul, who was to become one of the greatest men in the entire Roman Empire. A little bit later in, in the book of Acts, some of the rulers of the New Testament world trembled before Paul. He was such an awesome servant of the Lord. So start reading with me, starting in verse 6. Because here's his ministry residency. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew. This is Acts 13, 6, uh, whose name was Bar-Jesus, verse 7, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Barnabas, the sorcerer, or so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. By the way, a proconsul was a, a ruler directly named by the Roman Senate, who was a personal representative of the Roman emperor. So, so these proconsuls were very influential people. Uh, there were only a certain number of them. We still know who they are because it was so important. They were recorded in the, the, uh, the un- um, ending record of, of Roman monarchs and all of the intricacies of Roman rule. And so this guy was, was a direct delegate from Rome itself and from the emperor through the Senate. And that's why he was a crucial catch for the gospel. And Satan knew it. So that's why Elymas was, verse 8, trying to turn him away from the faith. Verse 9, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. Not yet seen that in the EE materials as a great way to start a gospel presentation. But, uh, you know, it depends on the, the setting, I guess. You enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? We certainly have come a long ways from apostolic times, haven't we? I mean, that would be politically incorrect. But that's what the Lord wanted, and it did its job. And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And verse 12, then the personal delegate of the emperor through the senator by the, the title of proconsul believed one of those dramatic moments in the birth of the, the church going out across the world and the, the signs and wonders that accompanied that and the Lord bearing witness with them as they took out the gospel. And he, by seeing this supernatural event, believed. Isn't that amazing? Believed when he saw what had been done and being astonished at the teachings of the Lord. Verse 13. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. Well, just look up now from your Bibles and think about it. Mark was experiencing what could truly be called the trip of a lifetime. Think about what Mark was going through. 
Mark got to walk and talk and sleep and eat and share every day with Paul and Barnabas. Just the meals would have been unbelievable. Can you imagine sitting with Barnabas here and Paul here and little Mark here and listening to those two men talk as they said, Oh, the Old Testament says this. And Paul said, Well, that means this. And Barnabas says, Well, this. And, and it would just be like an entire concentrated seminary with the guy that's going to write half the New Testament explaining it all. I mean, you know, we like the radio and we like to read books and, and have uh, audio materials. Can you imagine that? greatest discipler of the ancient world, Barnabas, and the, the, the man who codified Christian doctrine, Paul, talking over the meals. And John Mark's just sitting there going, and just soaking it in. But that isn't all. There were the cultural commentary Paul gave in the cities, the temples. I mean, here's Paul walking along. And you know how in Athens he started explaining everything. Can you imagine as they're walking around the Roman Empire and Paul's explaining the Greek and Roman gods and what the Bible says. And, and it's just unbelievable. And then there was the exciting boat ride. Look, they, they get on a boat in verse 4. And they start sailing. And from Cyprus they sail onward to the coast. And then can you imagine this, this supernatural blinding of this sorcerer and the conversion of this notable Roman leader? This was a trip of a lifetime. But look at the end of verse 13. I didn't read the whole verse, okay? Because after all that on-the-job training, all those special insights, all the precious fellowship, it was time to set off on a walk up the mighty Roman road. Now the trip was really going to get exciting. They were going to land at Perga, and they were going to go penetrating the center of what is today Turkey. And it was the most Roman province of all of Rome. Just a little sidelight. There are more Roman structures in Turkey than there are in Italy, where the Roman Empire was founded. There are more Greek temples in Turkey, which is this area that Paul was going into, than there are in Greece. And there are more biblical sites with parts of the Bible that are mentioned in our Bibles that are still there in Turkey than there are in Israel. I mean, this was the epicenter of the world in the first century, the most Roman Empire place of all. If you could penetrate the gospel into Turkey, the Roman province of Asia, you would get the world. And Paul knew it. And so he started right in the, the main corridor the main road going up from the coast into the heartland, he was going to take the gospel to the center of the Roman Empire. And at that climactic moment, another milestone. In fact, if you read past verse 13, you'd find out that this is Paul's first recorded sermon soon coming at Pisidian Antioch. It was a marvelous sermon. Multitudes responded, and, and the gospel does make it, and it starts radiating out through the Roman Empire. But look at the end of verse 13. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. I mean, he'd been in Antioch. He'd been with the two greatest leaders of all. He'd slept and ate and talked and walked and sailed. He'd seen the power of God so firsthand, it was just unbelievable what he saw. But verse 13, he quit. He bailed out. John Mark goes home. Was it too tough? Was it too uncomfortable? Was it too dangerous? We don't know. We don't know what made him quit. But we do know this. Verse 13 says he left. He literally left and went back home. He went back to his mother, back to the big house in friendly Jerusalem, back to the safety, back to comfort, back home. We don't know. Why? We know where he went. But that isn't the end of the story. Turn over to chapter 15 and verse 36 with me. Because the team went on, you know, the results were staggering with Paul and Barnabas. The most crucial event since Pentecost was unfolding. The gospel cut a path across the Roman roads into the dark pagan cities. Scores of people are born again. Churches are planted all over Roman province of Asia. Unbelievable events take place. It was the opening of the greatest in church history. But it was not just John Mark that had quit. It was Barnabas' nephew. Don't, don't forget that. It was Paul and Barnabas and Barnabas' nephew. His own relative that had left the missionary journey. That needs to sink in for a moment. Because, you know, 
blood runs thicker than, you know, you've heard the expression, you have to watch out because if you offend someone's relative, you offend them and everything. Something is going on. I don't know the chemistry here. But Paul and Barnabas could have taken anyone on the first missionary journey, and everyone would have envied that opportunity. But Barnabas had chosen his nephew, John Mark, the one Peter led the Lord, the one that lived in the, the founding house where the early church met. He picked him, and he went with him. So that makes for a problem, because Paul has no room for faint-heartedness in ministry. Where's the jail? Throw me in. I, beat me all you want. I'm never going to stop, guy. And this guy who didn't, for whatever reason, didn't want to go up that road, he has no place for him. I mean, he's just out of the equation, out of the question. Don't want anything to do with him. Look at chapter 15, verse 36, because here's the tragic split. Then it happened. John's Mark Choice splits up the greatest evangelistic team in history. Verse 36. Then after some days, they've come back after the first journey and all the exciting things have been reported. They've had the early church's first council and, and Paul and Barnabas are ready to go out on the second missionary journey. And they're going to take the gospel even wider and they're going to revisit the churches. They're going to get everything really going for the Lord. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, verse 36, let's now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Verse 37, now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Remember what Barnabas is called back in chapter 4, the son of encouragement? Boy, he was a great guy. He never gave up on anybody. Barnabas was a son of encouragement. And he, he had figured out what had been the problem with John Mark, and he worked it out, and he was going to take him and give him another chance. Verse 38, but Paul insisted. Usually that's when you have problems in churches, when someone's determined and someone is, else is insisting and they're opposite things. And, and so we have the tragic split of the team. That they should not, verse 38, take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. That's Paul's, I mean, he wouldn't even say his name. Can you, have you ever met someone they are so upset they won't even say the name of the person? Paul says, I will not take with me the one who departed from us in Pamphylia. I mean, he, he could not forget a quitter, a failure, a dropout, and had not gone with him to the work. Verse 39, and then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Verse 40, but Paul chose Silas. And we know Paul and Silas singing in the prison in Philippi and all that and all the other things. Being commended by the brethren in the grace of God. Okay, real quickly, getting to the bottom of this. When the word got out in Jerusalem of what the second missionary journey was going to be, can you imagine what happened when people found out that John Mark was summarily dismissed by Paul? that he wasn't worth taking on any missionary journey. It was surely that he was branded whoever knew him as Mark the quitter, Mark the fearful, Mark the failure. Well, we don't know what happened, but 20 years later, we do know what happens. Because 20 years later, turn back now to the Gospel by Mark, okay, with me? And I want to just introduce you to Mark. Because we don't know what happened between the advent of the second missionary journey, but and for 20 years. We don't have any written record of that. But 20 years have passed, and according to the nearly unanimous voice of scholarship over the centuries, John Mark was the one who became the personal assistant to Peter. Just like Luke was to Paul, John Mark became the aged Peter's helper. As Mark sat to capture the words of Peter's inspired by God's spirit record, they probably sat in a dark, torch-lit passageway, probably in Rome, what we would call the catacombs. Because somehow the hunted-down fugitive, the enemy of the empire named Peter, who was headed toward extinction, he was going to be executed by the emperor, somehow in that time period before he was executed by Nero, Peter and helper 
John Mark sat down. And the Spirit of God came upon them, and Peter spoke, and John Mark recorded. And they wrote this gospel. And John Mark was no longer a failure. He was restored, he was renewed, and he was vital. Now think about this, what, what was going on at this time 20 years later. The world that Mark served the Lord in was a terrible time in history. Some of the most memorable pages of church history are written during the time the Gospel of Mark was written. This is the time when hatred and the evils of Nero led to the acts of fierce persecution. Across the city of Rome, where Mark and Peter were sitting as they wrote this Gospel, believers were killed from the arenas to the prisons. For evening dinner guests, Nero would have followers of Jesus dipped in tar and burned alive on sticks to light the banquet. I mean, we're talking about intense danger to be a Christian. Have you pondered how hard it must have been for a Christian to live those ten years of Nero's reign? Yet it was so dangerous a time to even be a believer, yet Mark boldly wrote to the world of Jesus Christ sitting next to Peter. As he did so, seated by Peter, he was sitting next to the most wanted man of the day, and Mark demonstrated the holy boldness that Christ can bring into the lives of his children. Branded by all who may have known him as Mark the Quitter, Mark the Fearful, Mark the Failure, Mark began to write the gospel of new beginnings. Just by God attaching his name to it. Next to who? Peter, who also was a quitter, who also was known as the one who denied the Lord how many times? I mean, we all know it because we read these two former failures sit down. And there was a camaraderie there. And they sit down and the Spirit of God uses them to write about Jesus Christ who came not to serve. I mean, not to be served, but to serve as a servant. And to give His life. And to, to be the one who would pay the price for our sins. When I think of the Gospel by Mark, I think of the man who the Scriptures say God wants to use. God wants to use ordinary people. Remember it says in 1 Corinthians 1, it's not the mighty, it's not the, the noble, it's not the wise of the world. It's, it's the weak things that God uses. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31. Mark was ordinary. He grew up in an extraordinary setting. He was led the Lord by an extraordinary man. He lived in an extraordinary house. He was discipled by an extraordinary man, but he wasn't. He was ordinary. He was subject to all the fears and the pressures and the problems that all of us face. And that's just the kind of person that God wants to use. God wants to use those we might call failures to serve him. Before Mark wrote this gospel, he was a dropout from ministry. Paul was so upset that he was willing to lose his partner in ministry to take someone else, just not to take a quitter. But Mark was sitting next to another quitter. Another man who cursed and denied Christ. But Jesus had already restored him, as John 21 tells us. But you know, I think of another thing as I look at the Gospel by Mark. God wants to use young people. You know, Mark is always described as a young person. Sometimes youthfulness also has, has a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, flakiness or a little bit of uh, wobble there. Because they don't quite have their feet under them. They don't know. And, and you know what? God... He wants to use ordinary people. He wants to use those called failures. And he wants to use young people. And he wanted Mark. And he used him. And when I think of Mark, I think of this. Because every time we read this book, we experience the results of God's transforming grace. History records the pathway of Mark. Mark, the failed follower of Christ. That's where he is in Acts 13. Becomes Mark, the forgiven follower of Christ. When Barnabas got home, he, he made sure everything was right between Mark and the Lord and between him and that he was functioning well. Became Mark the devoted disciple. He doesn't drop out. He keeps following the Lord. Becomes Mark who writes what may be called the premier biography of Jesus Christ. But you know what history records? His last chapter is Mark became a devoted, faithful martyr of Christ. There are many different accounts of how he ended his life. One, which, which is most preferred, is that he went to Egypt. In fact, the Coptic church of today, 
is still supposedly attached to Mark. And in Egypt, he preached the gospel faithfully to the end until he was taken and tied by his feet behind a chariot and dragged to his death over the Roman streets of Egypt. Dragged to death, just being killed by the, the scraping of his body and bumping along the rocks. But they said he was faithful to the end. Mark. Mark should remind us of Mark's God, who can encourage all of us to keep going. He is the God of new beginnings. So when we begin this book, I always remember it starts with the Gospel of Mark. Mark the quitter, who became Mark the faithful, forgiven follower, who became Mark the dedicated, devoted disciple, who became Mark that was faithful even to death. Let's bow before the Lord and thank Him that He is the God of new beginnings as we celebrate a new beginning as we take part in communion this morning. As the elders and deacons prepare, let's prepare our hearts as we pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you didn't write this book in a vacuum. You give us so many beautiful insights. Thank you for this special record in the book of Acts so that we can never read the Gospel by Mark the same again. And thank you for the, the precious message it gives to all of us. We're in a new year. The old is past. And we are standing on the verge of a year we can live for you if we don't faint and draw back. And when we do, I pray that we would realize that you are the God who understands us. You're acquainted with all of our weaknesses. And yet you love us and your grace is sufficient. And the marvelous grace of our loving God is grace that exceeds our sins and our failures and all the past. And you are the God who are new every morning. You are the I am. You live in the present. And you want to point us toward the future. And you want us like Paul to forget those things which are behind and press toward what you want for us. And I pray that this communion, our first celebration together on Sunday morning in this new year, will be a celebration of a new beginning. May your spirit speak to every heart. It could be that some marriages need a new beginning because it wasn't a good year last year. It could be some families need a new beginning because they're frazzled and frayed. It could be that some individuals need a new beginning because they feel that they're so far from you. I pray that we would commune with you. You have laid before us this table and you want to speak to our hearts this morning and tell us that you are the God who forgives and you are the God who forgets and you are the God who gives us a new beginning. And I pray that we would accept that from you by faith. And realize that if we are in Christ, we're a new creation. And you are washing us clean every day. And may we thank you, because to whom much is forgiven, the same love much. Thank you for the bread, for the reminder that Jesus, you took my sin, our sins upon you. We worship you in the name of Jesus, and for his glory we pray. Amen.